Well, hello, everyone. Hello. Happy Friday. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. What I never know what to expect with, with the intro and where, where the emphasis will be. <laughs> it's obviously going to be uh just me me singing a hello happy song. friday, happy friday. <laughs> that one's new that yeah. one's new emily nice it's friday uh we've got to uh we've got to uh, get 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 down on the animal crossing on on friday yes um hello everyone <laughs> Uh, welcome to the Monterey Bay Aquarium Live here on Twitch and YouTube. Welcome to our stream. Uh, my name is Emily. Uh, I'm, I'm part of the social media team here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome, 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 welcome. Um, it's Friday. It's Animal Crossing time. We have no plan. And I say we because, of course, I am joined, as always, by my good buddy, our friend, our pal, our frond, uh, my coworker, my colleague, uh, our terrible boy, our terrible boy, Pat. Hey, everybody. It's your terrible boy, Pat, here, currently showing off one of the <laughs> pteropods that we have previously talked about here on the stream. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We've got lots of folks joining us over there on YouTube, joining us over there on Twitch. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's just so good uh, to see you a second time here in the week. That's the first time I think we've pulled that off in a while. Uh, Friday stream, Animal Crossing, after our Wednesday Friday stream that we did a little bit earlier this week. Uh, what's up, everybody? Thank you so much for uh, being there for yet another unplanned uh, Animal Crossing little adventure. Not exactly sure what we're going to be looking at. I, I have no idea what we're doing today, Pat. I, but, I, did uh, not, I did not think this through. No, you know, we're just going to kind of run around, maybe talk about some of our favorite animals again. We could maybe go to the aquarium again. That was kind of fun to just kind of re-explore yeah. uh, some of that world there. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just having we're just having a grand old time over here, joining all of you. So once again, thank you so much, everyone, for being there. Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, um, and for those of you out there who might be okay, so you know, at this point, Emily, episode thirty-nine here yes. of uh, Animal Crossing streams. There's quite a bit of lore. We went well, over that the last time. Um, the, not just Animal Crossing, trooper. just game streams in general. We haven't played Animal Crossing thirty. That's right. Times. That's right. Yeah, but th yeah. so there's a lot of lore there. So um, some folks out, out there, if you're worried about uh, me being called the the terrible boy, that's because I destroyed Emily's flowers the first time I visited her <laughs> island. I believe in episode one. So uh, don't worry, was. that's been established yeah. as part of the lore you, back in the day. You trampled my flowers. You stole my fruit. I did. It was a terrible time. It was a terrible time indeed. <laughs> But now I um, get to torture you too. I get to do things like this and just like smell what? you. That is still incredibly <laughs> <laughs> disconcerting. In fact, I'm going to go run right, uh, far away. I'm going to hang out with this duck. Saying. Oh, no, she found me. Sorry. A lot of peer pressure here <laughs> trying to figure out um, what's up, Doc, uh, for this particular stream. But um, yeah, thanks so much for being there, everybody. Uh, we really enjoyed the last stream. If you didn't check that out, uh, go back to our YouTube and Twitch VOD, and you should be able to see some of the good uh, stuff. Um, yes, Bibarel, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know that you could destroy uh, you could destroy the flowers by running through them. There's a lot that I'm discovering. I finally have pants on uh, in the stream um, already, are, are, so that's although good. Although Tarquin pointed out that you have kind of a Carl Sagan energy that you're bringing with the coat and the sweater. I don't believe oh, though, really? that Carl Sagan <laughs> wore purple punk pa pants. Um, I, I don't know I if he did. I could you be know, wrong. You know what color Carl Sagan's pants were, Emily? What what color were they? Pale blue with dots. Oh. <laughs> that was... That was a good... Hold on. I, I do he, have to. He looked, especially, he looked especially good suspended in a sunbeam. Um, that's one of my favorite scientific speeches, by the way, everybody. If it's you haven't uh, listened to Carl Sagan's pale blue dot speech, it is a wonderful uh, little bit of... Uh, Wonderful little bit of just thought about our place in the universe. And we're looking at the reason why the uh, why the Earth is one blue pixel there. 
uh, in that image from Saturn's ring, I believe, where that's where Voyager was taking its photo from. Um, you're looking at the blue pixel right there in that global ocean that we have there uh, in Animal Crossing and on our own planet, too. Um, <laughs> very, very excited. Hello, Santa Cruz. Thanks for being there. Oh, we've got folks joining in from New Zealand as well. Oh that's goodness. awesome. Yay. Uh, I, I trampled the flowers. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap. That is exactly right. <laughs> um yeah so uh that's pretty much what we have uh, I, I don't know we've got some questions about the duck there emily right there next to you do you know what oh. kind of duck that is <laughs> it's a it's a generalized duck in the game um but i i'm here to tell you that uh in our game they are representative of gulls uh so i've got quite a few of them spread out over here uh we also have one over here uh, that I'm pretending is a surf scoter, uh, which are all out and about in the bay right now. So we have these awesome uh, diving ducks, these surf scoters, um, especially the males. They get so pretty. Um, but they, they get do. these like flashy feathers during uh, certain times of the year. And um, with these just like bright, bright orange bills and these uh, white spots and, um, and black bodies. And they'll dive below the water the ocean um searching for noms and uh, yeah they're they're wonderful so typically uh what if you see one surf scoter uh you're about to see about 50 surf scoters somewhere nearby they they tend to hang out together um and last year i actually am very excited because last year i had a chance to go up to alaska and i saw surf scoters up there and it dawned on me that those are probably the same surf scoters that I see here in Monterey because I was up there in the summertime. They come down here in the wintertime. So um, they are another one of those migratory ducks that kind of travels and follows where the food is at. Um, so those surf scoters are visiting from uh, Alaska down here in Monterey. Oh. Hey, uh, Emily, you know, I have uh, a story about surf scoters oh, you, oh, that oh, I believe you? would fit. I believe would fit in the sock. Shall we go visit the sock potentially for a huh. thrift scoter story? Do I have a, I don't have a. Hmm. Um, points to anybody in the chat who knows what the sock reference is. Uh, uh, and then, hey, your boy Splendid's over there in Ecuador. We've also got uh, some folks running in from the UK. International stream. Uh, but let's Ooh. go to the sock. Let's to go. discuss some surf scoter things. Which way do, we, how, how do we get to your museum can, this way? It doesn't do we? matter. We can go this way. Okay. Does anybody remember eye. what the sock means in the chat? Did I lose you? No, you're there. Okay. Sock time already. Yep. So, sometimes you just got to sock it to him, you know? And, uh... Goodness, Emily. Cafe. Yeah. Exit mm -hmm. through the gift shop. <laughs> Always. And now here we are. There you go. Ultra Rat 5000 there over on Twitch. That's right. The seat of cursed knowledge. We're going to go. Yes, Jamis45 is over there as well. Um, uh, Emily, have you ever interacted with a, a blue-footed booby is uh, a question before we, we make it to the sock. You know, I proper. haven't. Oh, we're going to this sock. Okay. Um I have not interacted with blue-footed boobies. I've uh, interacted with uh, brown boobies, and we had a, a red-footed uh, boobie for a little while. But uh, that's right, yep. Sula. Sula, 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 Sula. Um, but no, never. That's on the life list of thing of the birds that I want to see, stare at, cry at, etc. <laughs> that's right. All right. Well, welcome everybody to the sock, the seat of cursed knowledge. If you're unfamiliar with the premise of this particular bench, when you find yourself in our company at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, in this part of our uh, of our museum, we are sat upon a <laughs> a throne of knowledge that will potentially leave you distressed, uh, stunned, shocked, confused. Um, or in my case, absolutely uh, feeling awesome and overjoyed at just how cool the world <laughs> is. Um, because the seat of cursed knowledge is there to let you know that no matter how bad things get, things can always get worse, uh, especially as it relates to parasites 
and horrible uh, horrible intestinal distress. And that's what we're here to talk about today related to the surf scoter there, Emily. Uh, because what we have here uh, with the surf scoter is actually a really important story related to our sea otter work. Because surf scoters, being that marine duck you were mentioning there, uh, Emily, we actually saw a whole bunch of them on the beach the other day, uh, diving around through the surf. And on the beach were a whole bunch of mole crab, sand crab, emerita crab, uh, molts. And so those are all washed up there along the beach, which means that there's a whole bunch of sand crabs there in the sand doing what they do best, sticking their antennae out and filtering food with the wave uh, rolling up the beach and then rolling back out and they're gathering up little bits of food. And then there's shorebirds and other birds that are out there trying to munch on them. And inside these... Uh, inside these sand crabs, these mole crabs, are a type of worm known as acanthocephalins. Acanthocephalin means spiny head, horny head. They've got horns on the front of their face. And they live in the sand crabs as uh, little commensal or uh, animals or even maybe parasites on the crabs themselves. But like many parasites, those worms have a two-host life cycle. So they live in the crabs, but then they have to complete their life cycle by being in one of these surf scoters inside one of these ducks. And then the ducks have the cysts that then they poop out and then it gets into the sand crab and the uh, sand crab has the worms and then it gets into the duck and so on and so forth, pooping out the, the cysts, getting more worms into the ecosystem, fed on the crabs, crabs fed on the duck, etc. Well, what can happen though, is that sea otters are a common forager along those beach fronts. And every so often there is a sea otter that starts feeding mostly on those sand crabs. And inside the sand crabs, they're loaded with those worms. And those worms can end up burrowing into the intestines of the sea otters and start causing internal bleeding and a bunch of inflammation. It's really, really bad. And I believe the proper term is acanthocephalin perionitis. Um, oh, and also uh, it affects the, the brain of the, of the otter as well, I think. Is that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the worms get into the otter and it's really bad. It can cause a lot of problems with... Um, with the sea otters because those parasites are not living out their natural uh, life history inside that duck. And so every so often we get otters at the aquarium that are heavily, heavily wormed that need to be uh, treated for. And that's why they strand. And so that is one of the more common reasons that a sea otter might strand in this area is because of uh, lower quality food that it might be feeding on. Maybe it's starving in other places, not able to really forage and then finds this area with a whole bunch of worms like fighting keeper worms or the sand crabs and starts feeding on them and then gives itself a major parasitic load that then we take care of at the aquarium before we release them back out to the wild. So I just want you all to take a moment right now and just sit with the idea of having a whole bunch of worms with spines and horns on the front of their head burrowing through your intestinal wall because they can't find their way into a surf scoter and just sit with that feeling no. and consider the next time you eat a mystery sandwich that you're not exactly sure where it came no, from no, that we can all be very thankful no, 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 no for uh for not being a a surf scoter or a sea otter that is my sock story for today uh acanthocephalins surf scoters sea otters and uh it just makes me happy to be able to share <laughs> that kind of story with all of you i'm with you amy i refuse i refuse to imagine it oh so that's my sock story <laughs> oh. It's the seat of cursed knowledge. The seat of cursed knowledge. Um, now you know it. You can't forget it. Once you know it can't be unknown. The seat of cursed knowledge. <laughs> That's all I got. If we get nothing else out of the stream, then there, there it you is. Go. Oh, well, look at look at the the followership dropping off. We had some people who uh, just hopped in and now now they're gone. Oh, oh no! And now they're oh, gone. No. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, Tipsy is about to steal the my pants. He doesn't deserve them. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I will find a way to forget. That's right, Sarah. Well, I'm just going to come in person and remind you every time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, anyway, if any of you out there were um, were wondering, you know, what's going on with, uh, with surf scoters and sea otters and sand crabs, now you know. Do you have a, a terrible story to share related to birds, uh, Emily? 
I mean, there are many terrible bird stories that you can tell. Um, upsetting, you know, anat anatomical things about birds and, and ducks in particular. Oh. Um, I mean, <laughs> if you, <laughs> I don't want to like say it on s stream too too much, but like if you find yourself on you know a weird corner of the internet uh, <laughs> at any point, and <laughs> and you uh, Google. Uh, duck reproductive organs. Uh, just just brace yourself for that that image there, uh, since we are talking Absolutely. about ducks. Um, I did. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna steer this steer. Get it? Because I'm wearing steer that ship costume. away from. Yeah, I'm gonna steer okay, that that ship away from from that conversation there, Pat. Because uh, I did notice a question <laughs> in the chat that I missed before uh, yeah. when we were talking about. Um, when we were talking about our Skoder friends uh, out there, uh, we had a question. Uh, there aren't any true marine ducks, are there? Um, yes and no. So um, there aren't any ducks who rely like solely on the ocean. Most of them are either um, going inland and going to the ocean for part of the year, or they are both coastal and marine ducks. Um but uh, you have like three species of scoters out there and they are really basically just heavily focused on um, foraging in the ocean and in, in uh, coastal areas. Like they are built for diving in the ocean. Uh, so they are definitely the closest marine duck that we do have out there. Um, there are other ducks like, um, I, and I, forgive me because... Again, this is another one of those names that I hear so infrequently, but I read all the time. Uh, I, so I pronounce them eiders. It's E-I-D-E-R. Uh, but eiders are um, also just like built like tanks. They're, the, they're just like the tanks of the duck world out there. And they can um, often uh, be found uh, diving in the ocean as well and in coastal areas. Um, and you have things like buffle heads. I love buffle heads. We used to have buffle heads at the aquarium and they are like the cutest little friends. They're the smallest duck in North America. Um, they get that name buffle no. head because, um, when people first saw them, they thought that their heads were reminiscent of buffalo, aka bison. As uh, so these big giant poofy heads and these teeny teeny little bodies and just like these stubby little bills. And <laughs> oh my God, they're the cutest things. I, I saw some a couple of weeks ago and I was, uh, out. Oh. Uh, doing a socially distanced birding with Susan uh, up in Elkhorn Slough. Uh, so we were up there and we got to see a whole bunch of buffle heads and it was wonderful. But they definitely um, are, are coastal birds, they're wetland birds, and they're, uh, um, you know, uh, hanging out in the ocean as well. Um, but they're Emily. definitely more coastal versus pelagic versus like um, the scoters. Oftentimes you'll see them further away, um, like actually out in the ocean versus buffle heads, which are definitely more coastal and and wetland and estuaries and things like that. And then mergansers. We see mergansers off the back deck of the aquarium pretty often too. So um, they're also diving ducks. They're, they're heading out there and, and uh, they have these really long and skinny bills that are actually serrated. Uh, so again, if you want to Google a terrifying image, you can Google uh, merganser bill and you can see like, it looks like they have teeth. They're, they're just like super serrated, uh, like serrated knife. Um, so they're built to hold on to like really slippery uh, prey out there in the ocean. So um, you definitely have ducks who spend time in or on the ocean, uh, but none of them are specifically marine ducks. It, it's one of those like, are, yeah. If you I have a question, answer. Emily. Yes. Are, are mergansers ca they're catching uh, fishes with those with those beaks, right? Yeah, yeah, they can catch fish, fast, fast swimming fish. Yep. So, would you say that they have the bills to slay the scales? Oof. You can I, say. I that. tried. I won't Skills, say it. <laughs> bills, scales. <laughs> I tried. There was something there. There. Yeah. Um, so there's some there's some things bring, <laughs> being brought up in chat related to these ducks, but uh, Emily, before we get to, um, don't female ducks have spines in their cloaca or something like that? Uh, yeah. Which is a question from Magnus the Radical. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I was gonna try and avoid the conversation here, um, but uh, but shall, shall we sit back down? <laughs> 
I mean, we can. I, it, oh, I'm all ears. We don't have to. Yeah. But. So, so basically, <laughs> so ba oh no, my controller fell asleep here because I have just been. It's trying standing. to tell us not to not to go into it. Yeah. Um. Maybe we can just that's some that maybe that's some homework. We can have people look up duck reproduction <laughs> on their own time. <laughs> 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 because maybe that. Uh, yeah, Emily, I, there was a story related to the buffalo heads. I think we need to find a different a different bench because the sock might not be um, the proper venue for this. But um, there's a, a buffalo head going on an adventure story at the aquarium. You're familiar with that one, right? I am familiar with that one. Should we share that? But maybe find uh, I, I want you to share that the story of the buffalo head adventure. But I don't think that the the sock is the is the proper venue. Would you like to find happy duck stories yeah, bench? Let's find a, yeah, let's. <laughs> Let's find a happy duck story bench. I feel like maybe let's find, let's find the uh the chair the chair of delightful of of delightful content. <laughs> we need a different acronym. Um where did you go? Uh, I went over to the um the coastal okay. fish area. All right. We just have to find a slightly different venue for this story because this story is all uh it is just all fun and games very heartwarming yeah well, we hang out here like next to the little pond okay and then there we go and then i gotta i gotta do the camera work here come on now i'm listening to you intently <laughs> can see that <laughs> tell me the story Emily. gather around children <laughs> gather around gather around oh look our sturgeon's in the background that's cool <gasps> it is hello friend um yeah our coastal fishes are actually uh finally like getting filled out in here are you okay i heard a, a crash everything's fine Everything <laughs> pat pat <laughs> pat are you okay it's okay the blood's pooling oh no, no. No, we're fine. We're fine. <laughs> I just <laughs> dropped my phone on my face. Um, looking for my notebook to remember what the name of our sturgeon was. If anybody in chat knows what the name um, of our sturgeon was right away. Or if you remember, Emily. Oh, no. I, don't I know that our pike that in the background. On. The pike in the background is Pike Wazowski. <laughs> yeah, Pike Wazowski. <laughs> that makes um, me so happy. I know that oh, there are so many names that we that were thrown out for. I can't remember which one that. For the sturgeon, what did we end up coming up with? Because we talked about. We talked about sturgeons like quite Madonna. a lot. Madonna was it? Madonna. It was like a, Madonna was like a sturgeon. Um, yeah. But I don't think we landed on Madonna. Nope. Um, I can't seem to find the note. No, AV is saying Madonna does sound familiar. Madonna does sound familiar. I think we just M-Jesh. threw it out there. Twenty-five. Okay. Okay. There are there's some agreement on Madonna in there. If anybody wants to go back and watch the episode, Deborah come back and report Phil. back. No, I'm totally Phil kidding. The sturgeon. We'll figure it out. We <laughs> We'll figure it out. I like Madonna. <laughs> um but okay, so Emily. So Pat. We've had Bufflehead at the aquarium. We don't we currently don't. have any. We don't. Um, they went up to Oregon. Yay. They went up to Oregon. That's right. But yeah. while the Bufflehead were at the aquarium, there was um, there was a little bit of a story related to the Bufflehead. Yes. Um, Will won't. Don't worry. You're only about 30 minutes into the stream. We just we just started. Uh, you've <laughs> you've missed some terrible content, but terrible content. Uh, hey, but... <laughs> that's what I'm here for. <laughs> but we're we're here. We're here for story time about our bufflehead ducks. Yay! Yeah. So we had a uh, you know a couple of buffleheads at the aquarium um, that lived in our aviary. So the way that our aviary um, is laid out is that you have um, water on either side of a walkway inside of this enclosed area. Um, on the left side of it, we have kind of this area that um, has like a coastal area with the wave machine and everything. Then we have a little pond over there as well for the birds to hang out. And then on the right side uh, is the estuary 
at the estuary area. Um, so that's where like in the water itself, we had guitar fish and bat rays and some of our young leopard sharks and, and other fishes over there. Um, but that's also the space where our uh, bufflehead ducks lived in. And there was uh, one time where we were doing, and I don't know every single detail of this story, but I know that we were doing some work over there. Um, in particular, we were doing some work um, uh, cleaning out that side and uh, work on the pipes over yep, there. Yep, we were draining. Yeah, we, we were draining, draining that tank. We were draining yep. that tank. Um, so the water was being drained out of there through <laughs> a fairly large pipe inside yep. of inside of that space. Um, and while it was draining out, you know, most of the birds are hanging up on uh, on the um, on the sides on the land, and um, <laughs> but this bufflehead saw, you know, all of a sudden there is this new space uh, <laughs> inside of their exhibit, and they went to go explore this new space, <laughs> and so a bufflehead duck decided because it is a diving duck to dive. <laughs> into this pipe directly, <laughs> directly into the pipe directly into the pipe <laughs> directly whoosh. Whoosh with all the water into the aquarium um so our aviculture team and our uh our, our our control team had to figure out where that pipe was going underneath the aquarium where it was like where the water was in real time and then <laughs> open up that pipe uh underneath the aquarium you know it's it's open and it's concrete and there's like drains and everything down below so we can you know if any of the pipes were mm -hmm. to ever like spring a leak leak or anything like that or when we pig the pipes um we have to have ways that we can open them up so that we can clean them out and um all of that stuff can either go uh, one way or the other, and, and, and one of the ways is to take those pigs, shoot them through the pipes, and then all of the gross stuff from inside of the pipes gets shot into the basement of the aquarium, which then we can wash out and clean out. Uh, but uh, we had to figure out which pipe it was, where to open it uh, at the right time so that the duck could whoosh, well, it, <laughs> wash right out. I, with the, the I believe it came water. directly out into the sump because they, yeah. they, uh, they were, you know, uh, cleaning that out. So all this water was coming out. And so... Yeah, the the aviculturist saw the duck disappear and then ran down to the ran down to the basement. And the basement people were just like, "Oh, it'll be here soon." Yeah. <laughs> <There's> the <duck. laughs> and then there was the little duck. <laughs> it, was a, uh, <laughs> it was like a brave little toaster adventure for that duck, just like oh, just oh, look, a water park yep. just opened. Oh, up. hey, <laughs> yep. Yeah. Just went down the slide and had a had a fun little fun little moment. So that was that was the day that the bufflehead decided yeah. to get adventurous and explore the drain. <laughs> and it was totally yep. fine too. Like it like got a checkup with Dr. Mike and everything and it's <laughs> just fine. Totally chill as could be. Just went on a little water slide adventure there. I think that we were more panicked than the duck was, but Oh yeah, no, the duck oh, was yeah. definitely just like that was rad. <laughs> the duck was just like, let's go again. Load me let's back go up, again. let's go let's again. Let's go again. I saw um... so many things. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, I, almost, I mean, you gotta think from the duck's perspective, it's like discovering the underground level in Mario or something. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Do 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 do. <laughs> Bufflehead in the basement. Bufflehead in the basement. Yeah. If you <laughs> mentioned, do, do, talk do, about do. an Octodad segment. Yeah. <laughs> that that duck yeah. was just trying to reenact its favorite Octodad uh, moves there. Just. <laughs> exactly right. Um, <laughs> hey, Bib Burrell, uh Just so you know, you can take you can take about ten percent off. It's totally fine. People are responding to the story that we're telling right now yeah. on the uh, on the stream. Nothing's wrong. Uh, uh, yeah. So the um, yeah, that's the story of the bufflehead going story on a little bit of, of an adventure uh, yeah. there, um, and that's uh, this is our this is our uh, bench of duck. Let's see, what would it be? No, this is our chair of. Our, um... Hmm. Of duck discovery, our cod, cod? <laughs> with two D's. I don't think that works. If someone comes up with a good uh, acronym in chat, put it in there. <laughs> yeah, the duck, the duck is totally fine. And now hanging out up in Oregon, so good stuff. 
Yes, bufflehead ducks are extraordinarily cute. The bench of duck drama. The bod. <laughs> the bod. <laughs> the bench of... Um, hmm. I'm trying... Because I don't want to just narrow it down to ducks, just in case we do get any what other, if it, like, bird ducks, content. Ducks are... So what if we did, like, the bench of bird something? Bob. Bob. Hmm. Of bird... Well, what I know is that if it was the the ducks are dastardly and um, ducks are dastardly, uh, <laughs> uh, colon bench of duck drama, then we would have uh, dad bod. <laughs> but I don't think that'll I do work. like Turkin's suggestion bench of aviary tails because then it's a boat. Oh, bench of aviary tails. Yep, that's pretty good. Let's do it. Bench or, of aviary tails. Or if we tails. say bench of avian tails. Uh, bench of avian then we tails. Because include tales about like Makana and... and Yep. Uh, yeah. Because Ma Makana is wonderful. And tails spelled T-A-I-L-S. Okay. Yes. So we've got the boat to go along with the sock. <laughs> and then we also had something else in the open sea that I completely forget. That was another one of our benches that were named. Yeah. <laughs> um get around to all of it yeah cool <laughs> well we did it we did and now it. i'm just doing now i'm just doing some hardcore butt parkour <laughs> cool okay well um was there <laughs> was there anything else oh yeah sorry will won't you had a question uh i have not read this particular study um, okay, uh, it's about cephalopod vision. Where would we like to go look uh, at a cephalopod here, Emily, so we can talk oh. a little bit about their color perception? We got a cephs over here. Let's go. Uh, I lied. Oh my god, <laughs> I went the wrong way. We're going, oh, we're going upstairs to the left. Nice, 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 nice. Oh, um, while we go over there, Dire Hermit wants to know what do we like on our pizza because they need to know if the animals are being cared for by monstrous pineapple pizza eaters. <laughs> uh, well, I'm... fun fact for everybody watching is that the Hawaiian pizza that you've probably heard about with pineapple and ham was not invented in Hawaii. It is also not uh, a native Hawaiian fruit, the pineapple. Um, there's a lot of uh, politics around pineapples in Hawaii. Um, so I've actually found out that there are uh, quite a few members of the Hawaiian community that are really not too stoked that the Hawaiian pineapple pizza is what is referred to as the Hawaiian pizza. A fun fact related to that that internet meme of um, being a monster if you enjoy pineapple on your pizza. There's actually a lot of uh, interesting socio-political discussion around um, pineapple, generally speaking, being a non-native plant and actually the source of a lot of uh, difficult times in Hawaiian history related to that crop. So definitely not calling pineapple on a pizza a Hawaiian pizza anymore. That's something that I've learned. Um, <laughs> but I'll put just about, I mean, I make pizza at home. That's a little bit of uh, terrible boy lore. Um, I definitely make a whole lot of pizza, and I've definitely put pineapple on those pizzas because that can be tasty. But um, that's just me running out of things to put on my pizza by the end. <laughs> you could call it food for thought, Wilderness Gay. Yes, I think that'd be <laughs> very appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't put pineapple on my pizza, but that's just my own you do not? personal okay. taste there. I like I like mushrooms on my pizza. That's my that's my jam. Yeah, I love. Yeah, I mean it's tasty. Everybody eat, <laughs> everybody eat good stuff. <laughs> yeah, do what you uh, want. If it makes you happy, like eat, eat whatever you want on a pizza. Yep. Um. Okay. Cephalopods. Cephalopod vision. Emily, do you feel like uh, taking the? Okay. So just to reference the original question from Will won't is. Um, are we aware of the recent study that showed that cephalopod vision impacts their chromatophores and their perception of bioluminescence? Um, they uh, didn't realize their eyes are U-shaped. Um, and then the other part is color receptor in their eye. Their pupils change in shape to let them see colors one at a time gradually. 
cephalopods are colorblind question mark question mark so um i have not read this specific study that you're that you're referencing but if you could whisper it to us i'd love to uh read about that but yes cephalopods are uh colorblind they don't see color the same way that we do my understanding and without having read this particular article is that cephalopod eyes and cephalopod vision is really uh, good at distinguishing the polarization of yeah. light and patterns uh, in the light. Um, whether or not they're able to perceive color one at a time like that, I haven't heard that, but potentially. Um, uh, how do I whisper? I only shout things into the void. Uh, there's a little, uh, <laughs> there's a little message icon where you can, yeah, you can chat with us directly. You can because you can't put the link in the chat directly here, but you can send it to us. Um, but yeah, so they, they're really there to see a lot of polarized light. Um, and then the, the pupil, I hadn't heard about the U. I know in the um, cuttlefish that the wavy pupil there is really there to help them see uh, differences of contrast in a horizontal plane where they tend to be hanging out on the seafloor for cuttlefish. So I haven't read that specific part there. Anything else? Uh, uh, yeah, Emily, go for it. No, sorry. I was just going to hop in. Um... I haven't read about the bioluminescence, but um, the I, I have read about it came out in like 2016 about the shape of their um, their pupils, how how that affects how they perceive color, uh, and it all has to do with chromatic aberration. Um, huh. So basically, like we have these round pupils um, that can dilate or. Uh, what's the opposite contract of like contract <laughs> yeah sure contract constrict, constrict. dilate dilate and constrict constrict was the one that i was trying to think of dilate and dilate and then the opposite yeah I um is to help the classic us, term yeah so that we can uh focus light on our retina um but with that wavy uh pupil or that u-shaped pupil um it actually will basically like break apart uh the the light as it's entering their eyes and when it hits the retina it can almost act like, almost like a like a, a prism and, and split that light in different ways um oh. and, and so like if you have ever had like your eyes dilated before um you know it makes everything around you very blurry um but it also kind of gives this like colorful like haze around mm -hmm. everything um and so that's basically what the shape of the pupil is doing in cephalopods is that they are colorblind, but um, by basically manipulating that chromatic aberration, that's that colorful haze that we would see, like if our eyes were dilated around everything uh, by manipulating that um, when it hits their, their retina um, that basically will tell their brain, which then tells all of their, their chromatophores, like what, color of light is hitting their retina then interesting um, yeah it's really really cool stuff and, and like obviously like they're they're still learning so much about it oh no oh no sorry the, the screen fell asleep again uh, oh. um Classic. <laughs> but but yeah so like uh you have those w-shaped pupils and those u-shaped pupils of uh so w-shaped pupils um are going to be in things like uh, animals like cuttlefish and things like cuttlefish, uh, animals like cuttlefish, uh, you shape peoples in, in um, uh, cephalopods like octopus. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just kind of maximizing that kind of that, that haze that would be around there. It's really, really cool. I think it was, I'm going to get this wrong. I think it was maybe Ber it was done at Berkeley. It was, it was done nearby. It was like it was either Berkeley or Stanford, and I apologize to our our colleagues studying octopuses up there. Um, but yeah, if you yeah if you 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 Google it, if you check it out, it's really it's a really really fascinating paper. But I haven't read the stuff about how it impacts bioluminescence, so I definitely want to read that. That'd be really cool. Anyway, that was this is fascinating. I'm reading the abstract right now of that paper very very cool we can put that we can put that in the chat for everybody i'll do it right now Woo. boom 
read up everybody that's super awesome <laughs> yeah the idea of cephalopod vision um and you know I, I i feel like we often get this false sense that human eyes are the best eyes uh which is not at all oh, the no. case no, no. um and <laughs> as somebody as somebody who is blind without contact lenses uh definitely i, I have a few notes um but uh the um, the cephalopod eye, just the octopus eye, is one of those really interesting things where the eye evolved separately from our lineage that gave us eyes. Uh, and the cephalopod eye, like an octopus, they don't have a blind spot like we do, where our eye is kind of inverted, where there's a hole in the back of our eye where our optic nerve goes. Yeah. Um, and that's not really great design uh, necessarily. Uh, and but we compensate by having our, our brain kind of fill in fill in that gap there. So so much of our visual information is really our brain interpreting what's going on in front of us and filling in those details, which is how you can have uh, really, really amazing videos of like, I don't know if you've seen that video of um, the students passing a basketball around to each other and then somebody in a gorilla suit shows up. And if you're just watching where the ball is going, like you're instructed to do, you might completely miss the person yeah. walking by in the gorilla uh, <laughs> suit because your just brain isn't isn't processing that that information or uh, at the same time, uh, but with a cephalopod eye, they don't have a blind spot, so they actually have their nerves in the quote proper way. If you were to build your own eye with the nerves behind the eye instead of poking a hole through it, um, and what they're able to see, and what especially what they what they care to see is also uh, very different from what we would uh, usually see, which is why, you know, an octopus can be incredibly well camouflaged, but we as people diving might be able to see it plain as day uh, because of just how our eyes work and our ability to see patterns and things being uh, something that is on land typically. And then in the water, you know, I can often see a cephalopod trying its darndest to hide, but you wonder if it's completely invisible to the other animals around it based off of how their eyes are working. So fascinating, fascinating stuff. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, Will Won't. Ooh. We'll learn a little bit more about cephalopod eyes later today. That's awesome. Yay. Sweet. Oh, my controller's asleep. Goodness gracious. <laughs> I was trying to find if I, I can't, I can't find the name. So this is a project for me through the holidays when we're not streaming and we have a few days off. Uh, from from the stream schedule, Emily is I'm I'm going to write down all of the names for <laughs> the animals so we can look it up. And I think Fiore, uh, I don't think Fiore is on the stream right now, but I think Fiore was going to offer to help us uh, put together a wiki of all the different terms. That way, we have it available for everybody to look look into. Do you remember the name of our blue swimming crab? Oh no! I'll try to find it. Uh, I don't. Did we? We must have named it. Yes, we did. Um, we did name it. I can't. I can't find it. We named it when. Oh boy. I'm looking for it. I can't find it. It's so sad. I know we have a name for. Her. <laughs> we named our char Mander. <laughs> yeah, we did. That one I remember. <laughs> We, so also there, named there our, we also named our we also named our our Arapaima I tank therefore Arapaima yeah I Arapaima <laughs> <laughs> goodness quite a few I don't wanna the arowana <laughs> I can't find what our blue swimming crab is called does anybody remember hmm oh we did make oh an it was a dabba d dabba die. Was it Dabadi, the blue swimming crab? <laughs> Dabadi, Dabadai. Yeah, the Gazami crab. Yeah, it's a blue swimming crab for us here in California. That's what we would have here along the coast. Uh, Jennifer, um, the Gazami crab, the blue swimming crab. Yeah. Wasn't it Dabadi? I think it was Dabadi, it might the have blue swimming crab. Yeah. Okay, perfect. We found it, everybody. <laughs> we got there. We got there in the end. Yeah. Did we name our lionfish? We must have. I would like to propose to rename it Truth, the lionfish. <laughs> <laughs> or no. cannot tell, or George cannot tell a lionfish. All right. <laughs> and not just Simba. <laughs> That's right. Because it can be, uh, it can be another king, you know. 
Uh huh. Wow, that's right. Wow. Wow. <laughs> he is our okay. Lion King. Good stuff. Um, <laughs> that's not six pack, but that is an abalone. It is. No, that's Mamma Mia. That oh, is Mamma Mia. Mia. The abalone. Hanging out. Doing a good time. Mm hmm. <laughs> Tarkin was thinking Sieg Siegfried <laughs> and Roy, because Roy is king in French, so that would oh, work. Oh, that would work. The lionfish. Or do we just name it Roy, you know? Roy. Wah! Um, Waz in the chat happen whenever we mention something that is kingly, like a king salmon, a king crab, or in this case, our <laughs> Simba king lionfish. Wah! <laughs> Wah! Um, there's a request to talk about Ray the penguin. Emily, should we go find one of uh, your penguin neighbors and talk about Ray? Sure, we can go talk about Ray. What do we think? Seems like a Ray's. Or wait, maybe request. we can go. Maybe we can go to the room of the of the ancestry of all the animals and then go to the penguin there. Oh, that's true. That way we don't have to leave the museum. All right, I'm on my way back that. to you. Okay. Oh, who are uh, Siegfried and Roy? Uh, oh, we just um, aged ourselves. <laughs> uh, they were famous uh, big cat trainers in the circus back in the day. Yeah, they were. They were in Vegas. They had a show. Yes. They, in the Mirage. Penguin talk. Ooh, Kawaii Cookie is very excited <laughs> for some about penguin, the penguin talk. talk. All right. All right. I almost ran the wrong way. <laughs> oh sharon dury drury oh please tell the world that we have sea stars and not starfish our sea stars aren't fish thank you <laughs> uh i'll go off on a slight tangent there that um at the aquarium we don't mind saying sea star or starfish it really depends on what the audience is responding if the audience says starfish that's awesome we just use sea star if we feel like it because uh they're not fish but importantly, um, sea stars are also not a ball of gas, um, a, a ball of fusion suspended in space held together by its own gravity either. So they're not really a star. Um, the, the, the words that we use are all about, we talk about this on the stream all the time, the words that we use are all about imparting meaning and understanding. So if somebody says Patrick Starfish to me, that's fine. We know exactly what they're talking about. If they say sea star, also understood that. There's so many things that we call fish that aren't technically fish. Like a hagfish is a jawless fish, but it's less like other fish than we are to fish, and we don't call ourselves fish. So once you get into it, you know, as long as we know what we're referring to, I'll say sea stars just for myself. Um, but I won't say uh, I won't uh, necessarily correct somebody saying starfish if that's the term that they know, uh, because yeah, they're not fish. They're echinoderms. Um, but, uh, yeah, generally speaking, we definitely, they're not fish, but they're also not stars technically, as long as we understand what we're talking about, use that common shared language and then talk about how cool sea stars are after the fact there. That's my own little soapbox. And yet yeah, sea stars do breathe. Uh, they breathe with, um, their tube feet and also with papillae that they have on their back, their skin gills. So often when you see a sea star really booking it or eating uh, something like one of the giant spine stars that we have out here, um, those will look incredibly fuzzy on their back because they have all of their gills exposed to try to get extra oxygen as they digest and chew on their food um, or rather slurp up their food. And then they also have little tube feet at the end of their arms that are extra sensory, allowing them to smell uh, their way forward. And that's also surrounding their little eye structure known as an ocellus or ocellize that they have there. Um, there you go. Yep. Oh, pairing central linguistics major. I approve this message. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Whew. All right. Uh, where were we going to go? Over here. Yep. Penguin talk. Penguin talk. Penguin talk. Penguin Demetrodon. Penguin Woo. Penguin talk. Asteroid. Woo. Ready? 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 Uh, oh, no, wait. That was the wrong blue dot. Hold on. You were talking about blue dots earlier. Pale blue dot. Carl Sagan. Oh, no. Stand on the dot, Sagan. <laughs> If we were rapping, that would be a good line. Standing on the pale blue dot. Sagan.
Uh, your hot take is that animals that breathe through their body's feet is like having AC units in every room of the house and having lungs gills is like having central air conditioning. That's awesome. Oh, Carl Sagan wrote Contact. I think I knew that. It's a very good, it's a very good book. A uh, book, movie. Very good movie. I have to... Okay, so is that the penguin? Uh, well, this is where the penguin would, would be hanging out. That's where the penguin would stand. Yeah, because everyone else here, they're they're all mammals. They're all mammals. That's right. So I had to change into my penguin shirt. <laughs> nice. Penguins. Love it. Yeah. Yeah, what do we want to talk about about penguins? Oh, yeah, we were going to talk about Ray. Do we, I mean, do we want to talk about a penguin? I mean, Evolution? let's talk about Ray. Okay, we can first of all. Okay. <laughs> you can't bring an evolution new nerd into the into the fossil. Uh, no, talk, the, talk, talk about talk about penguin uh, Evo. Do it. Uh, okay, so here's the deal, my friend. I'm gonna grab some water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, like one of the biggest questions in in science was. Uh, like where did penguins evolve from? Because, you know, when we typically think of birds, they're up in the air, they're flying, et cetera, et cetera. But penguins notoriously known for not being able to fly. So the big question in science was, did penguins evolve from uh, uh, birds that already could not fly? Or if, when did they lose that ability to fly? And uh, they figured out that uh, it was like, six, they, they evolved from uh, birds around, um, uh, 66 million ish years ago, right, right around the the, the KT extinction, um, that already could not fly. Um, so they they were not the ones to lose the ability to fly. It was birds before them. So don't blame penguins for not being able to fly. That is that is the moral of our story here. Um, they get along just fine without being able to fly. Um, someone was asking, are puffins and penguins related? And they aren't. So this is kind of uh, where, again, if you're looking at ecology and evolutionary biology, you have two very similar species that evolved very similar adaptations, but are totally unrelated to each other. Um, so uh, seabirds, uh, in particular puffins, are part of the Alcidae family uh, so these are all the diving seabirds out there so they're like your common mures and puffins um <sighs> Pat, sorry you okay buddy uh, i'm just huffing and puffing just, over here oh goodness <laughs> <laughs> oh you thought emily's stream was going so well and i'm back <laughs> sorry oh no i'm i'm behaving now keep going i was just huffing and puffing uh-huh uh-huh proceed uh-huh uh, so anyway, puffins. <laughs> <laughs> Back to birds. Um, so yeah, so the Alcidae, the 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 puffins and and their cousins, uh, are only found up here in the northern hemisphere of the globe, um, and then penguins are only found in the southern hemisphere of the globe, um, and that's really because the equator is a huge, huge divide when it comes to animals moving across this planet, especially if you cannot fly. Um, there's just so many factors that go into trying to cross the equator on our planet. Um, you know, tides and, and currents being one of them, where food is at being another one of them. Um, just, it's it's a very, very difficult line to breach. Um, so penguins are, are, are only found in the Southern Hemisphere. And puffins only found in the northern hemisphere, but they look a lot alike and they eat a lot of the same types of fishes and, and things like that because they occupy that same niche. So um, in, in ecology, you know, you have very specific, you know, kind of imagine if you were like a puzzle piece in the ecology of this this place where you live um, and you need to have certain things in order to fit into that puzzle there. Um, so the penguins and the puffins occupy that same, they, they're basically a, the same, same little puzzle piece just for those different spots in those habitats, both in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. So if you had puffins that traveled down to the southern hemisphere, because penguins have been hanging out down here in the southern hemisphere for so long, and they are basically the experts at being that puzzle piece down there, they would totally outcompete puffins at this point. 
And the same thing goes if penguins all of a sudden learned how to fly and they traveled up to the northern hemisphere up here. Puffins and the other alcids have <clears throat> basically perfected being that puzzle piece up here in the northern hemisphere that they would totally outcompete any penguins that come into those space. Um, that also, you know, applies when you think about invasive species around the world, that sometimes you have species that fit that same little puzzle piece in an environment um, that are much better at being that puzzle piece and can outcompete maybe native animals, uh, and, and then you run into trouble because they can outcompete those animals and then wipe out an entire species because of the invasive species being brought over. Um, the same thing would happen, you know, if, if all of a sudden, you know, we release the penguins here, we say that, you know, puffins basically, you know, occupy that same niche, but who knows, there could be some super penguins out there, just some really buff penguins that <laughs> could just <laughs> totally wipe out, um, you know, the, the, the puffins up in in Oregon and, 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 and in Alaska and things like that, you know. So, oh, no, I, again, I'm not pressing buttons often <laughs> enough. I get very, very in, involved in my puffin and yeah. penguin talk here. Um, so, uh, so hey. puffins, penguins, unrelated to each other, short answer there. Um. <laughs> hey, hey, Emily. Hey, Patrick. <clears throat> what do you call a violent puffin? I don't know if I want to know what we call a violent puffin. Oh, I'll God. Sid Vicious. Hey. hey. <sighs> oh, this is awkward. <laughs> okay, I'll take awkward as a pun. Yep, but... it is. <sighs> I guess I'll give you Sid Vicious, too. Yay! Tough crowd. That's okay. Oh, boy. Oh What'll boy. he do next? Um, and for anybody who is in the chat just ready to write this up and send it to us, we are both aware, Emily and I are both very aware, that yes, there is technically a breeding colony of Galapagos penguins yes, yes, that yes. is technically in the Northern Hemisphere, because the Galapagos are right there on the equator. And so some of those penguins are swimming around there in the northern hemisphere, technically speaking. But that does not make penguins a northern hemisphere uh, species um, for our consideration here. So if any of you are out there getting ready to type it up, <laughs> yes, we know. We know that there's Galapagos penguins that are in the northern hemisphere and that there's a breeding colony there. But for all intents and purposes, it's to the equator and then south of the equator so if anyone out there was trying to type that up we know <laughs> um but yeah anyway so that's the most northern penguin that, that we have there otherwise they're south of the equator but uh emily did you tell while i was getting some water did you touch on the fact that we often get calls to the aquarium and messages on social media <laughs> when there's a common mer hanging out on the beach here locally and they're just like did one of your penguins escape <laughs> oh, and we get no. to have that exact same discussion that you just had yeah. about the convergent evolution and similarities between those diving birds yeah, yeah happens yeah. all the time yeah, i have people so often yeah just people texting me like, have you seen this? Are your penguins okay? And it's just a common mirror There's that's just chilling. <laughs> Santa Cruz. What? No. <laughs> yep. You're like, no, it's it's no, supposed it's, to be there. It's supposed yep. to be there. It's a common mirror. Everything's okay. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, um, you know, hmm? did you know, uh, you know, for, for, for seabirds, you know, common mirrors can be very loud, um, but they're, uh, you know, you can often hear a common mirror colony, uh, they're, they're, they can be very noisy, but when they want to tell you a secret, do you know what they do, Emily? Do they murmur? They murmur. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, uh, no, that's, that's clearly a mammoth, uh, <laughs> uh, Emily. Clearly, that's a mammoth, not a deer. Here's Sorry. the deer. Yeah, there's the... <laughs> Sorry. You see it? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, dear. Oh. Wait, 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 wait. Now it's going to take me longer because I can't use my shortcut. Uh, oh, uh, well, uh, well, 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 this gay is asking, is it pronounced niche or niche? I, or niche? I think you niche can go niche. either way. It's niche, yep. niche. Yeah. I say niche, typically, but niche is what I've been told makes the most sense in regular english <laughs> uh, talking to people i from all of my ecology classes i've had professors who have said both 
So I yeah. I say you you go with whatever you want to <laughs> say. It's uh, definitely not Nietzsche. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not Nietzsche. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's 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 a little bit that's a little bit different. Yeah. Um, but Pat, all this penguin talk came up because we were going to talk about Ray. We're going to talk about Ray, our little ray of sunshine. Well, I guess, and we can talk about raise the roof, raise the roof, our raison (laughs) d'être. That's like one of the proudest hashtags that I that I ever. That's a that was a good one. If you ever saw the raison d'être uh, pun that Emily came up with in our Instagram hashtags, our Instagram and Tumblr hashtags are where we do some of our most obscure work, Emily. But <laughs> there are some people out there that read it all. <laughs> this is very public acknowledgement of puns, uh, but some of our best work happens in the Instagram yeah. hashtags, I would say. <laughs> um. Yeah, but I guess niche. we can talk. Yeah, we can talk about. Um... Oh, Jomas forty five is saying that no English people say niche. Okay, I've okay. heard niche in in the U.S. mostly, but yeah. You know, like I said, you you do you. <laughs> that's that's yep. yeah. If people uh, know what you're talking ra- about. Hmm? Ra- raison d'être is uh, like your your reason uh, to your reason of existence. Literally, yeah. um, it's like your essence. It's mm-hmm. like this is your 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 modus operandi, your raison d'être. This is why I exist. This is what I live to do. Mm-hmm. Is what that means. Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, talk about Ray. Let's talk about Ray. Let's talk you about go? Ray. I'm just in the other room. I'm hanging out with some some fossils over here. Um, some dinos. Some, some dinos. dinos. Some, some dinos. of our some of our some of our our little friends. Some dino nuggies. Yep. You Ooh. dino. Just you know. Uh, <laughs> so you know, we were talking about penguins. Most of the time, when people think about penguins, they are, are, are thinking, you know, like me hanging out here. I uh, got my my little snowy cap on. I got a sweater on. I got your kind of classic penguin hanging out on my sweater here. Um, this is kind of what people imagine in their brains. They think of emperor penguins. They think of snow and ice and Antarctica. And it just being cold and frigid, um, but that's not not the case. There are only a couple of species of penguins that actually live in the snow and ice. Um, for most penguins, they are actually temperate animals, um, and that includes our penguins here at the aquarium. They're African penguins, uh, so they live in South Africa and Namibia, um, are where they are are natively found down there along the south, uh, the southern and western coasts of those two countries, um, and. The reason why we have our penguins here at the aquarium is because they're an endangered species. So all of our penguins at the aquarium, critically endangered, they're critically species, endangered. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Over the last hundred years, their population has declined by more than ninety-eight percent. So very critically endangered birds. Um, so they're definitely in need of help, which is why they are at the aquarium. Um, our birds belong to something called a species survival plan. So basically, all of the accredited zoos and aquariums in North America work together uh, with our colleagues across the world um, internationally uh, you know we're working together to make sure that we have a genetically diverse bank of penguins just in case something were to happen to that wild population where we would need to step in and repopulate um, right now, of course, there are a lot of efforts in South Africa and Namibia itself um, to try and save those penguins from extinction, um, which we are also a part of. Um, it's um, part of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums SAFE program, Saving Animals from Extinction. So we're working with our colleagues down there to come up with creative solutions to saving these animals from extinction, um, whether that is... You know, our Seafood Watch program here at the aquarium, encouraging people to eat sustainable seafood. Um, Part of that, the reason why uh, African penguins are so endangered is because the parents are having a hard time finding food to feed to their chicks and feeding themselves. Um, But that's also coming up with creative solutions like uh, building artificial nest boxes for these penguins in South Africa. Um, So we partner up with um, a a group called SANCOB, it's S-A-N-C-C-O-B. Uh, South African Foundation for the Conservation of Coastal Birds. Um, they're an amazing group that works directly with South African birds, uh, coastal birds in particular, in, in South Africa, doing rescue and rehabilitation there. 
and uh, efforts to try and save these penguins. Um, so we work with them. Um, we did a, a well, it, it was a Kickstarter, right, Pat? A couple of yep. years ago. Yeah, it was a Kickstarter mm -hmm. um, where people helped to fund some of those artificial nest boxes and the research that went into building them to create like the perfect uh, nest box uh prototype to try out down there in South Africa and um, from what we've heard uh, they've been pretty successful so far with those artificial nest boxes which is uh, amazing news um, but uh, we want to make sure that you know we have a backup plan just in case and, and that's what that special survival plan is so safe it kind of encapsulates a lot of different efforts that zoos and aquariums these accredited institutions across the globe are doing to make sure that these animals don't go extinct um, because we've lost a lot of birds <laughs> around the world um, especially recently so we want to make sure that that doesn't happen to to these these wonderful 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 penguins um, so that being said ray is actually a product of that species survival plan um, so that genetic bank of penguins that we have here means that we kind of keep track of the penguin family tree of all of the penguins, the, the African penguins in zoos and aquariums across North America. And uh, we find penguins that would be good breeding pairs. Uh, and uh, every now and then those pairs of penguins are uh, basically, <laughs> we, we give them permission to, to lay an egg, to incubate the egg and to uh, hatch that egg into a, a tiny little wonderful chick of hope. Um, <laughs> and so I, don't laugh at me. I get very passionate about this, Patrick. The chick of hope. <laughs> yes, the chick of hope and Ray. Ray is a, a little ray <laughs> of hope uh, there. Um, so uh, basically Ray's parents, uh, genetic parents, I should say, uh, were, were kind of paired together. Um, they didn't do so great as actual parents. So we actually swapped their egg out for a wooden egg and moved Ray's egg under one of our more experienced pairs of parents uh, so that they could uh, raise Ray, uh, which is a fun sentence, raise Ray uh, and, and take care of her. Um, but Ray hatched with um, a lot of uh, vision um, troubles. So she was cataracts. Yeah, she had cataracts in both eyes. Um, one eye of which she was basically completely blind in, and the other one almost nearly blind in. So um, once we found that out, and we found that out very early on uh, after we hatched, um, she was then raised by our aviculture team behind the scenes. So our aviculture team took care of her back there. They raised her, made sure that she grew up into a happy, healthy little penguin, even though she couldn't see. Um, and then we worked with our veterinarian, Dr. Mike, and we worked with our colleagues over at UC Davis, the veterinary program over there. Um, and they performed cataract surgery on Ray. Um, That's right. And were able to uh, at least establish um, enough vision in one of her eyes that she can see fairly well now. Um, and, and, and the other eye, uh, she's not completely blind in anymore. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so Ray, she gets a lot of extra help from our aviculture team. Um, but she's very familiar with humans because she was raised by humans behind the scenes, um, because of those cataracts. Um, so she often um, will come up to people and interact with us. And she, for a very long time that she was, she, she, you could tell that she thought that she was more human than she was penguin. Um, over the last couple of years though, um, we've really been trying to train her to be more penguin <laughs> than she, than she <laughs> is human. Um, and that includes, I've, you know, every now and then when you're watching the penguin cam, you'll see us do special training with Ray in the water, getting her more comfortable in the water because when she was a chick, she was totally afraid of the water, which makes sense. She couldn't see. And so she couldn't find food under the water. The other penguins were so fast and they would bump into her and she'd bump into them. And so, um, you know, now that she can see, she's still kind of tentative around the water, but because of this training that our aviculture team has 
put in to get her more comfortable in the water you know she'll hop in there now she'll swim around and hop in and we'll give her food in the water now and um she's reached that point in life where she is getting more comfortable with being a penguin that now she has a penguin boyfriend and it's like watching your child grow up because like she hatched but while Patrick and I were, were at the aquarium. Like, like I, I used to do the penguin program in, inside of the narration, inside of the exhibit. And Ray would come and, like, hop up on my lap and just hang out and <laughs> give me little honks and and snuggle. And, and yeah, and so it's... Um, yeah, it's it's like watching your kid grow up and, and go on and get their first boyfriend. And it's... It's very emotional, Patrick. Yeah, no, it's it's really it's really cute stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, for for those of you wondering, you know, Ray is uh, is a, a TikTok superstar over on our TikTok. If you check it out, um, <laughs> and also on our Instagram, Ray is uh, just such a really uh, fun time. Um, yeah. She's the best. She we just posted an Instagram reel as well of her making her, her little happy braise and honks. So definitely. Um, check it out and then yeah we posted a video recently of uh, Dassin helping uh, helping uh, Ray through her catastrophic molt which yeah. is something that happens with penguins where they lose their feathers once a year right around their hatch day it's very itchy and uncomfortable um, um. yeah it's very itchy and uncomfortable with uh, uh, <laughs> with losing all of their feathers and regrowing them. And so Dassin was there to kind of help help Ray uh, feel a little bit better about it. Susan hopped into the chat too. Yeah, Dassin is an excellent singer. So I think That's that that right. might be why Ray likes him so much because she likes to talk too. So I think yeah. that maybe he, he wooed her with his excellent tonks. That's right. <laughs> yeah, um, great stuff uh about ray we love ray our little ray of sunshine go take a look at uh, oh i made a video earlier in quarantine too of ray going on an adventure um that i recommend checking out over on youtube and other spots uh yeah no ray is a penguin uh that we're referencing here ray the penguin yep and And it's short for monte monterey (laughs) um nothing to do with uh a skywalker yeah uh reference and considering where the trilogy went i don't think we should be associated i'm just kidding i'm just kidding just kidding whoa there i just know that's the hot take that's the hot take world out there how dare you let people enjoy what they enjoy pat i know (laughs) we appreciate being associated with ray skywalker (laughs) or ray palpatine or whatever it is anyway don't do spoilers oh god pat huh what (laughs) what oh no are we talking about something oh god what are we talking about (laughs) what are we talking about next oh no What's up? Um, uh, was that so Emily? Birds are great. And... Ray, you're saying something? What, what was that? What? Huh? 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 You, what did you say? Okay. <laughs> I'm running out of the, <laughs> running out of the museum. Yeah, I'm running out of the museum, too. Uh, we're going to find a different topic to talk about. Uh... <laughs> uh, yeah, we named Ray first. So, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, now that we're outside here in the snow. Snow problem. Snow problem. Uh, what else should we do? Oh, what time is it? It's four, um, 447. Uh, 447. You know, uh, Emily, uh, I don't know. I'm kind of running. <laughs> I'm kind of running dry on... Uh, on topic specifically and getting into a, a diving and fishing uh, time at, at this time seems maybe, I don't late. know. Um, I do know that there was a request to talk about uh, mantis shrimp before. Pat, do you want to uh-huh. talk about mantis shrimp maybe? Uh, sure. I mean, we can talk about stomatopods. Stomatopods are an awesome, awesome crustacean. Um, they are not a shrimp like other uh, the true shrimps are the Cur- Caridians, Caridians. I don't know how to pronounce those specifically, but um, Caridian shrimp are more what we call shrimp shrimp. But uh, mantis shrimp is a stomatopod, which is a completely different type of uh, of organism. Oh, 
Oh, I know. Can you? Wait, Jay, just kidding. Wait, you can place that in your house, but I, I can't. Can, but don't go in here quiet. I'll place it and then you can come in. I don't know uh, where your oh, house is. Well, yes, you do. You run past it when we go to the beach every time. Uh, um... uh, here, we're going to go to the new room. I say new room. I, I just, I remodeled the basement. So I'm I, I'm at the beach where the fish bait is. How do I find your house? It's up up the stairs from there. Up the stairs from there to the left? The door. Yeah. Should I come in? Yeah, you can come in now. Okay. Um, but yeah, so the... Uh, and then go downstairs when, when you come into the house. Okay. Uh, stomatopods are a type of crustacean. Um, is that even correct? <laughs> They're arthropods. <laughs> They're hanging out. Uh, stomatopods are a completely different group of shrimp is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and they come in many different flavors um all really beautiful and and intense there are spearing uh stomatopods mantis shrimp that have amazing raptorial appendages that look very much like a mantis shrimp uh <laughs> very much like a praying mantis hence the term mantis shrimp uh <laughs> that they'll use to grab forward grab food uh into the sand i've seen um some of those out in indonesia some of the spears um they're also known as thumb splitters because they can really cause uh some some damage there and then you have uh the punching mantis shrimp uh where instead of having sharp claws they have these appendages that are like mallets that come forward and just punch uh their prey and we talked about this last time that um, these appendages can move so quickly through the water and cause such impact that they can create what's known as cavitation bubbles, where the water pressure lowers to the point that the um, water actually vaporizes and then that bubble collapses back on itself and produces a flash of light that is hotter than the surface of the sun uh, in so doing. And that cavitation bubble causes a secondary explosion of force from the original impact um, so basically, it's a one-two punch with a single move there with these mantis shrimp. And uh, my understanding here, Emily, is that we're going to do something where we bother the mantis shrimp in the yeah, go in, in the game. Go ahead and and, and uh, walk up to that tank and, and press A for me. Okay. <laughs> Whoa! Did he break the window? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so these are some strong aquarium glass here but it looks like still, we broke still it so repairing aquarium glass too we need to get our hands on some of that <laughs> can it break can it actually break the whole thing or no, it just punches the no, glass it just punches it okay so still, uh, i love that that's what they did here <laughs> that's why that's why it's so good to have this game because uh, do not bother mantis shrimp either in aquaria when you see them or <laughs> in the wild uh it's just rude all around, um, but they have been known to break aquariums uh, w that are in them when they hit the glass. So our uh, windows, thankfully, are acrylic, a type of plastic that is bendable, not crackable. That's for safety for uh, all of our all of our visitors and the animals themselves. Um, but yeah, well, that's awesome. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Good stuff. Boom. <laughs> Uh, and this is specifically a peacock mantis shrimp that you're seeing here. Yes. Um, and if you want to know about eyesight, we were talking about cephalopod eyes a little bit earlier. Mantis shrimp eyes have 16 color receptors, I believe. Um, we have three. Cephalopods have one. Um, and they also have three parts to their eye, three different focal uh, points to their eye. So they have a hexa nocular vision one eye is able to give them depth perception because they have three different focal zones there um and they think that a lot of communication happens between mantis shrimp in wavelengths of light uh that are bouncing off of the little paddles you can see there next to the side the little peacock eye there um with different uh different iridescent light and other polarized light they can communicate at a distance with other mantis shrimp using invisible signs that other animals might not be able to see, hence why they are so brilliantly colored. Um, there's a lot of information being shared with other mantis shrimp that is uh, potentially invisible to the other fish that are around them there. So really, really cool. Mm -hmm. And we have one of these, uh, we have had peacock mantis shrimp at the aquarium in the past. So maybe well, yeah. someday in the future. 
Uh, I yeah. believe there's still one in the Splash Zone Tunnel. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool. Anyway. Nicely done, Emily. Fun hey. little demonstration. Yeah, we've been seeing that in the chat for a few streams here about the mantis shrimp, and now we see it. Woohoo! Boom! Oh wait, hold on. I'll zoom in again when you do that. Uh, can you? See okay. It? I had it all set up. Oh no. Do it again. Hold on. Ugh. Okay, go. Okay, three, two, one. Pew. <laughs> Feisty boy. All right. Okay, anyway. Nice. I like it. Uh, Thanks for like, showing us like, that. You like my new room? I like this new room. I'm trying to figure out what the vibe is because we're at the beach on an iceberg. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, you know, climate change, so. Oh, hey, nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's the climate change. A pre-sea ocean room. Hilarious. Just, Nicely know, done. Trying to find my zen here in this chilly space. Got my fake palm trees. Well, with got all the my, ice all around, all I have to say, water. you know, I was, I was gonna, I was, I had something to say, but I've decided to let it go, let it go. <clears throat> Walking away. That was <laughs> ice. <laughs> nope. I'll see you later. <laughs> um, cool. I know that the penguins have been a, a hot topic of, of discussion uh, here during the stream today. So just an an update on uh, the penguin island. Uh, we we are still um, only at five penguins on our penguin island. So. Um, are are hoping to find two more two more penguins one one of these days because we got to keep we got to keep our cephalopod neighbors so anyway yep cool <laughs> I, I have nothing to add to that conversation <laughs> um on the bar I think uh, I think maybe we wrap it up. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. yeah that's a good I'm plan. Kinda hit hit my Friday. Hit that 456 Friday. Wall. Friday wall. <laughs> whale, whale come. Whale. Yep. <laughs> um. But yeah. Wait. How is their holiday time? Did you update all of the? Twitch emoji, Emily? I, I didn't, but people can use their channel points to ah. turn our normal Mola emoji into a holiday one, which is very good. That's awesome. It's very good. Great job, everybody. <laughs> well, hey, well, with that... <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to this Friday afternoon educational gaming stream here in Animal Crossing. Hope you enjoyed your time. Hope uh, that you uh, are all staying safe out there with uh, um, holidays, etc. upon us. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, double Animal Crossing streams here in the same week. Look at us go, Emily. We did it. Look at us. Look at us doing all the things. Um, we have no idea <laughs> with the next. So next week is the holiday. Uh, we won't be streaming on Friday because it's Christmas. Um, so we're actually going to take a day off, uh, which is, a, you know, what? Well, look at us being being all self care ish here. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so we uh, we'll figure out if we're going to stream on Wednesday. Uh, but there there definitely won't be a a, a Friday stream next week but we'll, we'll update you as things as things happen and as we get things figured out um yeah uh in the meantime you can always visit monterey bay island uh if you want if 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 you are so inclined to it's not uh updated for uh the the code has not been updated for winter time monterey bay, bay island it's still it's still fall time monterey bay island but if i if i find the time to before next week i might update it we'll see we'll see we'll see everyone um 
But uh, if not, then we'll update it sometime in the future because it's going to be wintry on the island for, for a couple months here. So, um, so yeah, you can always visit Monterey Bay Island. You can, uh, you can visit us virtually that way. Um, and we'll have posts and, and, and uh, if you go to the website, uh, we'll have the webcams up uh, all yep. the time. So those will still always be there for you and on YouTube. Excellent. Right on. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in to this episode. Check out the rest of the playlists uh, over on YouTube and in our Twitch VOD if you want to see more educational gaming streams. More Animal Crossing coming up in the new year. Uh, very excited to uh, spend more time with all of you virtually and hoping that the aquarium will reopen uh, in the new year. So to welcome all of you as well. Um, and uh, yeah, with that, everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. Yeah, with that... Um, we'll, we're hopefully going to have some cool stuff coming up in the new year. Um, it's been, it's been wonderful. Happy Friday, everyone. Um, as always, remember to take care of yourselves, be kind to yourselves, take care of each other, be kind to each other, and we will see you again very soon. Okay. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you.